Chapter sixty five of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter sixty five. Conclusion. When her term of mourning had expired, Madeline gave her hand and fortune to Nicholas, and on the same day and at the same time. Kate became Mrs. Frank Cheerable. It was expected that Tim Linkinwater and Miss La Creevy would have made a third couple on the occasion, but they declined, and two or three weeks afterwards went out together one morning before breakfast, and, coming back with merry faces, were found to have been quietly married that day. The money which Nicholas acquired in right of his wife, he invested in the firm of Cheerable Brothers, in which Frank had become a partner. Before many years elapsed, the business began to be carried on in the names of Cheerable and Nickleby, so that Mrs. Nickleby's prophetic anticipations were realized at last. The twin brothers retired. Who needs to be told that they were happy? They were surrounded by happiness of their own creation, and lived but to increase it. Tim Lincoln Water condescended, after much entreaty and browbeating, to accept a share in the house but he could never be prevailed upon to suffer the publication of his name as a partner, and always persisted in the punctual and regular discharge of his clerkly duties. He and his wife lived in the old house, and occupied the very bedchamber in which he had slept for four and forty years. As his wife grew older, she became even a more cheerful and light-hearted little creature, and it was a common saying among their friends— that it was impossible to say which looked the happier. Tim, as he sat calmly smiling in his elbow-chair on one side of the fire, or his brisk little wife, chatting and laughing, and constantly bustling in and out of hers, on the other. Dick, the blackbird, was removed from the counting-house, and promoted to a warm corner in the common sitting-room. Beneath his cage hung two miniatures of Mrs. Lincolnwater's execution, one representing herself, and the other Tim, and both smiling very hard at all beholders. Tim's head being powdered like a twelfth cake, and his spectacles copied with great nicety, strangers detected a close resemblance to him at the first glance, and this leading them to suspect that the other must be his wife, and emboldening them to say, without scruple, Mrs. Lincolnwater grew very proud of these achievements in time, and considered them among the most successful likenesses she had ever painted. Tim had the profoundest faith in them, likewise, for on this, as on all other subjects, they held but one opinion, and if ever there were a comfortable couple in the world, it was Mr. and Mrs. Lincolnwater. Ralph, having died intestate, and having no relations but those with whom he had lived in such enmity, they would have become in legal course his heirs. But they could not bear the thought of growing rich on money so acquired, and felt as though they could never hope to prosper with it. They made no claim on his wealth, and the riches for which he had toiled all his days, and burdened his soul with so many evil deeds, were swept at last into the coffers of the state, and no man was the better or the happier for them. Arthur Gride was tried for the unlawful possession of the will, which he had either procured to be stolen, or had dishonestly acquired and retained by other means as bad, by dint of an ingenious counsel and a legal flaw, he escaped, but only to undergo a worse punishment, for, some years afterwards, his house was broken open in the night by robbers, tempted by the rumours of his great wealth, and he was found murdered in his bed. Mrs. Slyderskew went beyond the seas at nearly the same time as Mr. Squeers, and in the course of nature never returned. Brooker died penitent. Sir Mulberry Hawk lived abroad for some years, courted and caressed, and in high repute as a fine, dashing fellow. Ultimately returning to his country, he was thrown into jail for debt, and there perished miserably, as such high spirits generally do. The first act of Nicholas, when he became a rich and prosperous merchant, was to buy his father's old house. As time crept on, and there came gradually upon him a group of lovely children, it was altered and enlarged, but none of the old rooms were ever pulled down. No old tree was ever rooted up. Nothing with which there was any association of bygone times 
was ever removed or changed. Within a stone's throw was another retreat, enlivened by children's pleasant voices too, and here was Kate, with many new cares and occupations, and many new faces courting her sweet smile, and one so like her own, that to her mother she seemed a child again. The same true gentle creature, the same fond sister, the same in the love of all about her, as in her girlish days. Mrs. Nickleby lived sometimes with her daughter, and sometimes with her son, accompanying one or other of them to London, at those periods when the cares of business obliged both families to reside there, and always preserving a great appearance of dignity, and relating her experiences, especially on points connected with the management and bringing up of children, with much solemnity and importance. It was a very long time before she could be induced to receive Mrs. Lincolnwater into favour, and it is even doubtful whether she ever thoroughly forgave her. There was one grey-haired, quiet, harmless gentleman, who, winter and summer, lived in a little cottage hard by Nicholas's house, and, when he was not there, assumed the superintendence of affairs. His chief pleasure and delight was in the children, with whom he was a child himself, and master of the revels. The little people could do nothing without dear Newman Noggs. The grass was green above the dead boy's grave, and trodden by feet so small and light that not a daisy drooped its head beneath their pressure. Through all the spring and summer time, garlands of fresh flowers, wreathed by infant hands, rested on the stone, and when the children came to change them, lest they should wither and be pleasant to him no longer, their eyes filled with tears and they spoke low and softly of their poor dead cousin. End of chapter 65 End of The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens Recorded by Mill Nicholson Website www.act2sc3.com